Good evening. My name is Erin Blankenship, and I have the privilege of being the interim executive director at the Florida Holocaust Museum. Thank you so much for joining us for this very first event of our fall season as we hear from Lucy Adlington, author of The Dressmakers of Auschwitz. Before we begin, I want to thank our staff working behind the scenes to make this evening's presentation very successful, as well as our board of directors for the Florida Holocaust Museum for your tireless work on behalf of our mission. I also wanna remind you that as always, we will be taking questions for our, uh, for our author at the end of the event. If you have one, please just type it into the comments below this window. And lastly, we will be including a QR code on your screen after the program. This will take you to a short survey about this evening's event. If you'll just take a moment to complete it, these surveys help us when we plan future events and help us when we secure funding to support our work at the Florida Holocaust Museum. And now I have the honor of introducing our speaker. Lucy Adlington is a British historian and writer with more than 20 years specialization in social history. Her recent history book, The Dressmakers of Auschwitz, is now an international bestseller. Her previous nonfiction titles include Stitches in Time, The Stories of the Clothes We Wear, and Women's Lives and Clothes in World War II, Ready for Action. Her fiction titles include the award-winning young adult novel, The Red Ribbon. She runs the History Wardrobe series of costume presentations and has an extensive collection of vintage and antique clothing. So please help me welcome Lucy Adlington. Lucy? Well, hello. Thank you so much for that invitation. And I've had such a warm welcome from Florida Holocaust uh, Museum. So it's a real, pleasure to be here today. I'm speaking to you from the north of England. So hello wherever you are and whatever time you are. And thank you for joining me today. Now I'm going to be speaking for about 45 minutes. And let me tell you, I could talk for hours on the subject of the dressmakers of Auschwitz. You can see some photographs of some of the women I'm going to be talking about behind me. And I wanted to give you a little idea of the sort of information that went into writing the book about these remarkable young women and their experiences during the war years and afterwards. Because when people think of a historian, you might think of archives. And certainly I've had a lot of archive visits, but there's so much more to it than that, particularly when you're looking at such um, an aspect of history that hasn't really been delved into a great deal. So I've been drawing on one of the most precious things to draw on is photographs. So you can see some behind me and I can show you here some photographs that were sent by families of the dressmakers of Auschwitz. I'm going to be explaining a little more about where these women were sewing and where they were from and how on earth it was possible to have a fashion salon in a concentration camp. So lovely faces appearing, appearing in my email intro. And this, is, this was really important for me after so many years of doing archive work and searching to find out who were the women who sewed in the fashion salon in Auschwitz. And to see their faces reminded me that this wasn't, it's not theory. You know, you're not just writing about something. Yes, it happened in the past, but it happened to real people. And there was that constant sense of remembering human beings, human lives. So it, it is a pleasure now to share these stories so that we keep remembering them. Talking of archives, there are actually very few documents remaining that link to the existence of a fashion salon in Auschwitz. And very few registration cards, for example, that's a copy of a registration card for one of the women. And it does note her profession here, Schneiderin in German. Of course, the Nazis attempted to destroy so much of their bureaucracy when they evacuated Auschwitz and so much was destroyed and lost. So not a lot to go on there, but you can make site visits, which I think is important. 
And so if I show you now, this, if you can see, is an image of a beautiful white building that's just on the edge of Auschwitz main camp. And this is the SS administration block. It's a repurposed civilian building. And this is where the fashion salon was housed. So in addition to that, I've also drawn on memorabilia that the families of survivors have sent me. And I'm just showing you fragments here. They're reproduced in the book of postcards that was smuggled out of the camp, which is it's quite remarkable to have these messages from, from such a place. And also an excerpt of, excerpt of diary kept by one of the dressmakers as she escaped from Auschwitz. So there's some of the photographs, there's some of the documentary sources. The most wonderful aspect of my research was also profoundly moving, and that was the opportunity to fly to San Francisco and interview the last surviving seamstress who'd worked in the fashion salon in Auschwitz. And her picture is actually here behind me. She's photographed here just before her deportation with her sister Katka. This is Bracha, Bracha Berkovich, and you read a lot about her in the book, because in addition to archives and photographs and site visits and so on, there's something about meeting a human being, meeting the person who was there. And that goes beyond documents and history, that opportunity to really listen to someone when they're telling their story. And of course, as a historian, the opportunity to ask all those questions of a person. And I had some really unexpected responses from Bracha as well. Most of the time, I just listened because she was very ready to talk. And overwhelmingly, she wanted to remember her friends. She wanted to remember lost loved ones, as well as friends who survived with her. And they kept their friendships for all the decades after the war. Now, how did I come to be interested in this topic? How did you know, I even find out about this? Well, it's all to do with my work specializing in clothes history. So that has been a huge emphasis in my work. And I'm going to be explaining to you, as well as introducing you to some of these, these women, I'm going to be explaining to you why clothes are so evocative and such powerful connectors with our past. Clothes hold memories. You know, if you've saved any mementos of your own family or some of your own clothes, perhaps from, from earlier years, you'll know this. And clothes tell stories. We don't always know what the stories are. There isn't always a label to tell us. But when you have the stories, they're, they're incredibly powerful, incredibly resonant. And in the case of these young women pictured here, clothes literally saved their lives. The ability to sew is what gave them a chance, gave them hope when everything seemed to be saturated with despair. And clothes have very strong political and cultural and economic impact as well. So I've drawn on a lot of uh, primary sources relating to clothes and dressmaking and so on. And I'll just give you a little example no, I won't. No, I won't. I'm skipping ahead. What I'm going to do is I'm going to introduce you to I'm going to introduce you to some of these dressmakers. That's the main thing. And what I uncovered as I was gradually able to connect and discover more and more about the names of the women who'd worked in this salon, which which hadn't really been known much before, was that most of these young women came from Slovakia. And you may have read about um, about the, the history of Slovakia during the war, once the Germans had partitioned and taken over Bohemia and Moravia, Slovakia was left uh, with a pro-fascist anti-Semitic government. And so researching the lives of these young women took me into a world of 1930s Bratislava, the capital of Slovakia, and also up to the high Tatras mountains, beautiful part of the world. And here I endeavoured to, to get a glimpse into the childhoods, the teenage years of these young women. So who can I introduce you to first? Well, you've heard me mention already Bracha and Katka, these two sisters here. Bracha and Katka came from a, a very poor family, but a very hardworking family. And their father was a tailor. 
So we read over and over of just how many Jewish artisans there are in Europe before the war, whether it's shoemaking or tailoring, dressmaking, millinery and so on. So their father was a tailor, an incredibly skilled man, and I've seen images of some of his work, really smart suits. And he was teaching Ketka, his daughter, tailoring skills, little knowing how important it would be. Braha wasn't so interested in sewing. She was going to go to a secretarial college before she was ousted from her education for being Jewish. So Braha and Katka lived on Zhidovska Street in Bratislava. It means Jew Street, a uh, leftover perhaps from more ghettoized times, but it was a very happy childhood on the whole, despite the poverty, and she had a lot of friends. So a couple of these friends are pictured here. And it is no coincidence that I found that of all the women who worked in the fashion salon in Auschwitz, they had connections, as in they were friends before the war, or they had connections through marriage, family relations. And so it's really heartening, really wonderful to know that the power of that human love and human spirit, those connections were one of the things that kept them going and kept many of them alive. So here's Bracha's best friend, Irene, Irene Reichenberg, and she didn't really want to sew either. It wasn't a burning passion of hers. And it was only after Jewish people were ejected from their, their work, from their businesses, from their schools, their education by the pro-fascist government that Irene was standing in the pavement. She said this in her testimony. She said, you know, we just stood there. We didn't know what to do next or where to go. And then she said, on the spur of the moment, I decided to learn to sew a little. And she had no idea, again, that, that fate would, would uh, enable her to use her sewing skills to survive. And Irene persuaded Bracha that she should learn to sew and they took lessons in secret because the, the, the fascist government had banned them from, from learning to sew. They took lessons in secret and they also persuaded another friend, Rene Ungar, a rabbi's daughter. So these are really young women. They're late teens, 20, very early 20s. And then a little bit older is Marta. And Marta is perhaps the crux of this whole history of how I believe nearly 40 women in total, 40 women and girls, were able to have an extra chance of life during their internment in Auschwitz. And it's all thanks to this woman, a truly remarkable, very quiet heroine called Marta. This is Marta Hooks, and she was a very talented cutter. If you know anything about dressmaking and tailoring, you'll know that there are various different specializations, but a cutter essentially transforms the pattern and the fabric into the garment. And Marta had her own salon. She was set up, she was very industrious. I had no idea, of course, what lay ahead of her. And then, tucked away here, much older than all of them. In fact, in Auschwitz, she was called an old woman. She was 35 years old, but that is old in the concentration camp system. But Hunya came from a town in Slovakia called Kezmarok, which had a, an amazing view of the high Tatras mountains. And she, like Marta, was an incredibly skilled dressmaker. She did an apprenticeship which many boys and girls would do at this time in the 1920s and 30s, often a seven year apprenticeship. And you would really get skilled at your job and you'd learn it from the most basic level of picking up pins and, and sorting fabrics and winding up tape measures through to specializing in buttonholes and setting sleeves and fit and cut and so on. Until Hunya was so good, she decided Kashmirok was too small to hold her. And she traveled west to Germany. And she set up her own salon in the city of Leipzig in Germany, the eastern part of Germany. She loved it. She loved the arts, she loved the culture, she loved the vibrancy, and she loved the dressmaking. 
she actually, although she was very skilled at doing, you know, your regular patterns, she also liked to always add a little bit of her own design flair. And she soon acquired uh, a lot of clients and she dressed the elite of Leipzig. And this was Jewish people and non-Jewish people. Did I mention they're all Jewish? So Hunya's experiences were somewhat different from the other young women in Slovakia, but for all of them, and too many women and girls for me to mention tonight, for all of them, their lives were converging on one place, a fashion salon in Auschwitz. Uh, if you hadn't heard of this before, and very few people have, it's um, barely been acknowledged or written about, you know, we didn't know anything, then you might be excused for thinking how grotesque this is. If you think of fashion, you might think of Paris catwalks and glamour and beautiful fabrics and colours and creativity and skill. And then, of course, we think of Auschwitz. And it, it is synonymous with hell, with horror. And so it's important to understand how on earth can there be in this place of horror? How can there be something that should be so beautiful. And it's very important to understand that although Auschwitz also at Birkenau was an extermination center, it was also created to make profit for the SS. It was about greed as much as it was about bigotry. And writing this book, this theme, this thread of greed runs all the way through it. Greed, vanity, entitlement, privilege. And countering, countering that are women such as these young dressmakers, the actual, the, the prisoners who are, they exhibit camaraderie, the friendship, the humanization, but against that, the greed of the SS, the greed of the Nazis. And this is bound up with fashion too. Fashion is big business. Even now, you know, fashion, the turnover of fashion, it's, in, it's billions globally. And so there are really strong links between the Nazi regime and the fashion and textile trade, which is disastrous for Jewish people because in Europe at this time, as elsewhere, you know, in the UK and in America, there is so much Jewish talent and Jewish capital in the fashion and textile trade. And there are many reasons for this. It's all incredibly interesting and impressive, but essentially Jewish people are running factories where we're weaving fabric manufacturers. They're involved in the design stage and marketing. They're involved in retail. And this is some of the, the, well, no, literally the best department stores in Germany. They're owned and run by Jewish people, as well as the smaller boutiques and the haberdasheries and the milliners and, and salons such as Hunyas in Leipzig. So the Nazis, when they come to power in 1933, they need money. They need to fund their military ambitions. And it, this need, this greed aligns with their anti-Semitic policies. So a few weeks after Hitler comes to power, a group of businessmen in the textile trade meet in a beer cellar in Berlin. And they're meeting to set up a federation of businessmen, and it is men, because women, although they are doing all of the administrative work and secretarial work, they don't have those positions of power. It's a very, very male regime. So these businessmen meet and they are discussing how can they get their hands on the money and the property in the fashion and textile trade. And this, this does link in. This does link in with our fashion salon in Auschwitz. So now I would like to, to show you a garment. And I hope you can see on the screen all right. I don't use PowerPoint. I really like how powerful and tactile objects are. If you can't feel them, you can perhaps at least imagine. So I'm handling now a wool tie from the 1930s, a man's, a man's necktie. And it's, uh, it's quite rough wool, actually. And it looks very nondescript. You know, there are no markers on it. I don't know who made it. 
I don't know who wore it, but if we look inside, here's where the story is. So if you can see, it's a little mottled, but A, D, E, F, A, and underneath the script in German, A, D, E, F, A, an, an acronym for ADEFA. This is this organization set up by German businessmen. ADEFA in English would translate as German Aryan Federation of Clothing and Textile Manufacturers. German Aryan. So Aryan, of course, this ludicrous made up concept the Nazis are emphasizing, it's Aryan, it means it's non-Jewish. The clothing is just stamped with anti-Semitism. So ADEFA, this organization, this federation is going to set out to make the, the fashion trade, the textile trade, Judenfrei, Jew free. And we know, we know where this goes. And the fashion trade is all, it's all connected. And it's not just ADEFA. So many businesses around Germany and eventually in German occupied territories are going to follow the same anti Semitic line. So I'll show you something that should be really innocent now. I love collecting sample books. So if you can see as I turn the pages, this is a book of yarn samples. They're knitting yarns and crochet yarns, and you can flick through, pick out the color, the weight, the blend. And you would think, well, that's really lovely. You can think of all the things you might knit with those. I can't knit, by the way. Not very good at sewing either. But the really sinister element is this, uh, this company, and this is the largest manufacturer and distributor of knitting yarns in Germany. It's big business. They have emphasized in the first page of their booklet that it is only Aryan production. So even the knitting wool is to be anti-Semitic. And we know the history of how shops are targeted, how shops are boycotted, but companies such as Adefa are working with the vile propaganda, utterly supported by Hitler's regime, to tell the German people that there is something despicable about Jewish fashion, that it's contaminatory, you recognize this language, it's inflammatory propaganda language. And they're telling, they're telling Jewish people only buy Aryan products. Aryan products made by Aryan hands, not Jewish hands. And I'll show you one more garment before I carry on. So this brings us to 1939. This is the, the, the rough date, approximate date of this dress. And if you can see as I waft it, it's a, a rather pretty little summer's dress, the sort of thing that uh, I would appreciate today. It's very hot in England right now. And it's a very light apple green crepe with a lovely floral pattern. And it actually tells us a lot. You see, I don't know who made this. I don't know who wore it. But as a clothes historian, you can look at the details and understand that this garment has been made with thrift in mind, economy in mind very narrow seams, very small rolled hem, very meager embellishment. And this is definitely in keeping with the German economy in 1939, where all resources are being diverted for militarization and invasion, and civilians are having to make do with what's left. So all right, you maybe feel sorry for civilians, you know, they're gonna have rationing, they're going to be a lot of restrictions, a lot of making do but I don't feel at all sorry for whoever bought this dress. Because inside, if you can see, there is the Adefa label again. This is one of those dresses that has not been made by Jewish hands. So it's so pretty and so hideous at the same time. So clothes do have stories. So 1939 in Germany, this is not a good time for Jewish women, such as Hunya, 
Hunya, who is uh, in, in Leipzig, no longer able to run her own fashion salon because as a Jew, she can't run her own business. She's meant to be destitute. And she has seen firsthand the increasing lack of liberty, the increasing bullying, the violence against Jewish people. Believe me, she resists. And you can read about her in the book. She is not taking it lightly. And she is, uh, she's put to work, not by choice, as a forced laborer in a fur factory because Leipzig is very famous for its fur trade. And this really highlights the hypocrisy of the Nazi regime. Because having worked so hard to render the textile trade, to, in fact, render all businesses and, 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 and cities and, and countryside to render them Jew free, they then, the Germans find, they don't have the laborers. They literally don't have the people in factories, the people manufacturing, the people doing the work. They've said, we don't want Jewish hands touching our goods. And now they find they can't make those goods without Jewish hands. So in factories as forced laborers, in ghetto factories, particularly in occupied Poland, especially, there are thousands and thousands of Jewish people who are making goods, and I'm talking clothing and textiles in particular in, in this case, making goods for so-called Aryans to use, but there are no labels saying, this was created by Hunya, a forced laborer. This was created in a ghetto by someone who was working for, for soup and bread and the right to avoid deportation further east. There are no labels to say that. And they're not only um, making uniforms for the Wehrmacht and for the SS, they are stitching SS uniforms. They're also reconditioning furs for the Wehrmacht in Russia. And they're creating civilian clothes, pretty dresses, men's suits, children's clothes, which are all shipped to Germany and sold in the shops. Again, no labels saying who'd made them. So we can see here this pattern of greed and exploitation. And for elite SS, for the, not only the men, but also their families, this, they become habitualized to, to taking what they want, to having what they want. And this brings me to the fashion salon in Auschwitz. How on earth was it set up? Well, it was established by the camp commandant's wife. The first and longest serving commandant of Auschwitz is Rudolf Huss. He's certainly the most famous figure associated with the camp. And Rudolf Huss long had ideas about, you know, his racial ideas, supremacy ideas, and so on. And sharing them is his young wife. She definitely aligns herself with national socialist ideas, Hedwig Huss. And as the years go on in their marriage and the, the family grows, they have children, Hedwig Huss follows her husband to his workplaces. Dachau, Dachau. Sachsenhausen near Berlin, and then to Auschwitz. She's a willing accomplice in this. The children, of course, know nothing, they're innocent. And so she grows accustomed to this sense of you can have what you need from the concentration camp system. When she arrives in Auschwitz, the family take over a house that's been stolen from a local Polish Christian family, and they fill it with plundered goods. And the, the house is full of furniture and artwork and tapestries that have been stolen from Jewish homes or stolen from Christian homes. And essentially they can take whatever they want. And what they can't get from plunder, because Auschwitz is a depot for plunder from surrounding territories in occupied Poland, they get from labor. And this labor comes from prisoners. So Hedwig decides she wants a garden at this villa that she now lives in at Auschwitz. She has 150 male prisoners work to build her a garden. She calls it paradise. And it's filled with roses and it has a swimming pool and a pergola and picnic tables. And it's just wonderful, a walled garden, nice little haven. 
And just on the other side of the wall is the first crematorium in the Auschwitz main camp. And the brick barrack blocks of Auschwitz main camp. And this is the paradise Hedwig is living in. In 1942, March and April, the first trains of women, Jewish women prisoners arrive, or rather the first official train loads organized by Eichmann. And these train loads of young women are aged between 16 and 40. And most of these train loads, these first train loads, official train loads of Jewish people who are women, they're from Slovakia. They are sold to the Nazis, 500 Reichsmarks by the Slovak government the women have no idea about any of this. So you can read in the book how these young women get their summons to go and report to a holding camp. And they assume they're going to a work camp, you know, for labor for a few weeks. And so they pack accordingly. And they're packing their best, their work clothes, their warm clothes, because it's still snowing. And they're packing mementos of home. And I think it's worth, I think it's worth making that connection with when we pack to go on a journey what you take with you, what matters to you. So they packed, and it was Irene really who first understood that this was, this was not going to go well. Because at the holding camp in Slovakia, she looked out of the window and saw that all their identity cards, their documents were on a bonfire being burned. And she thought they don't mean us to come back. But even then, at that time, there still wasn't an understanding that this would be a one-way journey. Although I'm very happy to say that thanks to Marta running a fashion salon for a lot of the young women who, who made it into this salon, it would be a return journey. So they had the, the now familiar, notorious cattle car ride into occupied Poland. And they arrived at Auschwitz and Bracha said she remembers, this is Bracha who I went to speak to in, in California. She said she remembers jumping down from the train and helping her sister Katka down, Katka had a, a weak heart. And she was upset because she couldn't reach her suitcase. And an SS man standing at the ramp, this was before the, the, the extra spur was built into Birkenau. He said to her, don't worry, we'll take care of your luggage. Well, he wasn't lying because all of their carefully packed suitcases and rucksacks and bundled were definitely taken care of. They were put into the plunder warehouses in the Auschwitz main camp. And here the luggage was sorted by prisoners. And this was actually work that some of the young Slovakian women got to do. And I say got to do as if it was a privilege, well, it was. Because when the first, the, the first labor they undertook was, was extremely damaging, hard labor. They were working in, on construction sites and demolishing houses. And Irene was, was literally building the gas chambers at Birkenau with, you know, with their bare hands. They're doing this work. They're clearing swamps and they know, very quickly they come to know, you can't survive that on starvation rations, with disease being rife, with the, the violence from SS. So if you can, you have to try and get better work. And for many of the young women, this kind of salvation was in the vast bonder warehouses. More were opened when, when Birkenau opened and the women transferred there. And it, 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 still, it still hurts me to think of the emotions that the, the prisoners had when they're sorting through these suitcases, opening luggage, and they're trying not to think what has happened to the people who packed those suitcases. In Irene's case, she found the clothes of her, one of her sisters, Frida and Frida's children. And by then she knew what this meant. They knew what the chimneys were for and Irene, she was terribly despairing and she said, you know, we, we're not gonna get out of this. We can't get out. There's only one way out of here and it's up the chimney. But Bracha, Bracha said, no. She said, we are getting out of here and we are going to tell the world what has happened. And we are going to have coffee and cake again in Bratislava. 
and she dragged Irene to work despite Irene's despair. But even then, even then it's hard to know if they could have survived because they see their school friends, the loss of life, it's just endless. And the living conditions in Birkenau, it's, it's not fit for human life. But then their luck changes thanks to Marta. And I'm not going to say thanks to Hedvig Huss, the commandant's wife, because when Hedvig chose a young prisoner, Marta Fuchs, to come and sew for her at the commandant's villa, this wasn't with the idea of saving a life. Oh no, these Jewish prisoners, they're suffering so much, I'll bring them to the villa and look out for them. No. Hedvig wanted someone to make clothes for her and her family, and she didn't want to pay them. And by a series of, of connections, and you can read about it in the book if you wish, Marta comes to work in the Commandant's villa. And she actually, she, she does child minding in this beautiful garden. But much of the time she's up in the attic sewing. Sewing for Hedvig, sewing for Hedvig's children. And that might have been the end of the story. But because Marta was in, she was incredibly kind and intelligent. She used her privilege to save lives. And it began with saying, well, I think we need two seamstresses. There's too much work. She got her friend Berta into the attic sewing room. And then Berta said, you know, we could do with a young girl to help around here. I think my niece, Rojika. And so Rojika was saved. And eventually, the other SS wives, seeing these clothes that Marta and Berta had made, they were so jealous. They wanted clothes. And like Hedvig, they were absolutely used to appropriating what they wanted. Plundering. They were used to taking clothes from the plunder warehouses, clothes that had been forcibly stripped. And, and it's worth just taking a moment to think about that. You know, you might dismiss clothes. Oh, it's just clothes. It's just fashion. But clothes give us dignity, don't they? Clothes show our identity, they keep us warm. They are very personal. They're incredibly, you know, clothes that we've made or we've chosen or we've shopped with friends or our grandma made them for us. All these clothes were deliberately stripped from new arrivals in the concentration camp system. I say deliberately, it was designed to humiliate and dehumanize. When your clothes are gone, you feel less civilized, less human. And then your hair is taken, your name is taken, and you're supposed to forget that you're human. But these young women never forgot because they had the opportunity to rehumanize through friendships and through meaningful work. So as I say, the SS women are very used to taking garments and whatever they want from the, the plunder warehouses, but they want these clothes to be made. They want their own couture clothes. And so Hedvig in 1942 established a fashion salon in the SS admin block, about 10 minute walk from her house. And in the admin block, there were also beauticians, masseurs, there was the laundry for the SS and so on, hairdressers. So everything to help the SS wives feel sophisticated and glamorous. The capo, the, the person in charge of the fashion salon was Marta. And she made sure that this sewing room with its fitting room was a haven. That not only would they be crafting fashions for the SS, fashions that were, as Hunya said, she said they were beyond anything the SS women could have dreamt of in their wildest dreams. So not only were they sewing garments, they were resisting. And partly they were resisting by the very act of staying alive and being human and in talking with each other. They could talk, they could laugh, they could share stories of home. And it's very telling that as soon as Marta had this fashion salon to, to operate with lots of clients, and I've got to tell you, they had so many clients that there was a six month waiting list for elite clients in Berlin. I mean, consider the hypocrisy of this. In Berlin, elite Nazi women are ordering clothes from Jewish seamstresses in Auschwitz. There was a big black order book with their names in. 
which was destroyed or lost. We don't know what the names are. We can speculate. So Marta is dressing Hedvig Haas. She's dressing the wives of other mass murderers working at Auschwitz. All the while outside, they know what's happening and they are in a haven. They are somewhat protected. They don't have to go for the punishing roll calls. They're still on starvation rations. And sometimes the SS clients throw them some bread or chocolate or whatever. But Katka, she actually said in her testimony, she said, we were not people to them. We were dogs and they were the masters. So despite that incredibly intimate relationship that you normally have between a tailor or dressmaker and the client, the SS women still could not see their Jewish dressmakers as human. So they're making these clothes, they're resisting through their networks of friendship, but they're also actively resisting. Marta Fuchs, head of the fashion salon, was a member of the Auschwitz underground. And you can read about her work. And really, it's, it's just remarkable to think of how she used her time and energy and her connections around the camp. Connections through the plunder warehouses. And if you know the story of um, Rudi Verber and Alfred Wetzler who escaped in 1944 to warn Hungarian Jews about plans for their extermination, well, Marta was friends with them. And she was next on the, the list to go if Rudy and Freddie, if their escape hadn't worked. We know it did with some success, but Marta was to go next. And she did eventually escape with a group of other dressmakers. And you can read what happens in the book. It has, um, has a, a, a tragic ending for some of them. So Marta is an active part of the resistance in getting food, medicines, whatever she can to other prisoners where she can, in listening to clandestine BBC radio, um, radio news and disseminating the news and smuggling news out of Auschwitz. But I think even beyond those, those very traditional roles of resistance, I think the very fact that she had decided that she was going to stay human and warm and keep her humanity by helping others, it's incredibly powerful. And she wasn't just looking to, to stay alive herself, she enabled up to 40 women and girls to have a better chance of life. And towards the end in 1944, there were a core of 25 women working in this fashion salon creating these beautiful clothes and their clients would come in, flick through the magazines. This is Die Mod fashion magazine, uh, German fashions, and they would choose what they want. Marta and her amazing team would make it. And increasingly, you know, so Marta invited Irene to join her because they were related by marriage. Irene said, I want my friend Bracha to come. Bracha got to the salon and said, well, yeah, I know a really good tailor. You need my sister Katka. And then they got Rene in and others. And this was how Hunya, Hunya came to the salon and it most certainly saved her life. No matter how strong and defiant she was, she could not have survived in Birkenau any longer. But uh, friends found out she was in Birkenau and managed to get her a place with Marta. So this, this group of Slovakian women and uh, they, I, could tell, I could tell you so many stories, so many stories of, of the camaraderie, of the resistance. And you can read in the book, if you will, of how they endured the evacuation of Auschwitz and subsequent camps. And then for the survivors, the return home. And the majority of women who passed through the fashion salon did survive. It's incredible. Given the death rate for the Slovakian women on those first transports, truly wonderful. And then they had to start life again, pick up the pieces. And one of the first objects they tried to get hold of was a sewing machine because that was their livelihood. So I'm going to show you another garment now. And I know I need to be finishing. And this is the most precious garment in my collection, or rather it's a suit. This is from the 1950s from Israel. It was originally a dress. 
and it's been turned into this smart pleated skirt with an amazing geometric pattern and equally smart silky jacket. So a two piece suit made from a dress and it was made by Hunya. Hunya, very redoubtable woman whose life was saved by Marta in the fashion salon and who then went on to help save many other lives. Hunya was certainly a, um, a, a driving force for many people surviving during the evacuation and subsequent con uh, concentration camp traumas. After the war, Hunya made it to Tel Aviv where she was reunited with some of her family, including her 15 year old niece, Gila. And she made this suit for Gila, her niece. She was also working for some of the very elite shops in Tel Aviv at that time. And she told Gila, she said, don't become a seamstress. She said, true, it saved my life, but you just sit there and sew. So ironically, but I'm so glad she did sit there and sew. Because as she was sitting and sewing, both for her clients and with love for Gila, she told stories of her life in Slovakia before the war, of her time in Leipzig in the 30s. She told stories of her time in, in Auschwitz-Birkenau. And she told stories of her friends in the fashion salon. She, she deliberately, she wanted these stories to be told, she said, so that their names are not forgotten. So Gila, while Hunya was telling these stories and sewing away, Gila wrote these stories down. And that was one of the, the most moving sources for, for my writing this book. So here is Gila's sewing made with love, not under duress. And it is worth thinking, who makes our clothes? You don't always have a label on to say, who makes them, you don't always know where they come from, but there will always be that story. And although my time is up, I'm so happy to have had this opportunity to share some of the stories of these young women. And I hope you will be eager to find out more. The book is now, um, it's now to be published in 22 different languages, including Slovakian and Hebrew. And, it's been, it's been quite remarkable really to appreciate just how much interest there is in this story. And I think it's so important that we look at stories of women's resistance and female friendships and celebrate that humble skill of sewing. So I'm gonna end with the words of Marta. And it's a little bit of a reveal because Marta survives despite being shot in an escape attempt, she survives. And you can read about her life post-war and uh, yeah, such a remarkable woman. And Marta said, sewing saved my life. Why should I do anything else? Amazing. So I am going to open the floor if there are any questions that you have on this subject. Thank you again for your attention. And if anybody would like to be in touch with me, my web details, website details are going to be in the chat. And I would love to, to hear from you if I can help in any way or, you know, if you have stories to share or anything you want to know. So thank you, thank you once again to um, Florida Holocaust Museum for this opportunity. Well, thank you so much, Lucy. This was a magnificent, outstanding program. Um, you know, for me, who is uh, whose work is so um, connected to objects and the things of living and the things of this experience, I really appreciated how you not only talked about the objects that you uh, discovered and researched as part of as part of your work, but you showed them, and I, I just appreciate that so much because I think that there there's um, real power in that. So thank you. Um, so we had a a number of wonderful comments um, from our viewers, and of course, lots and lots of great. Um, 
questions and uh, lots of folks that say they're going to run out and buy your book. So that's always great too. Well, um, I you wanted get to get it from the library as well. You know, you don't have to buy it from the library. Yes, oh, I'm a big book. supporter of our local library here. So oh, yeah. absolutely. Um, all right. And of course I lost it. <laughs> Well, while you're looking, there is an audio book. If you um, don't mind my English accent, my northern accent, you can also listen to the book as well. I uh, got very emotional recording it, I can tell you. Oh, I can only imagine. Um, and it, really, it hits home more, doesn't it? When you verbalize things, it's... It does. And, and you know, judging from through. your presentation, I'm sure it's, it's an excellent listen as well. So um, one of the questions um which has disappeared now but um would be how did you get interested in your your life's work being a clothing historian uh, oh gosh that's a big question since i was a child i've always loved images of people wearing you know vintage and antique clothes i just love that sense of stories you know what was life like for people then uh, my background, my academic background is in literature and mixed with history and archaeology. So there's always been that sense of the way people want to tell stories. I mean, I mean, stories, real stories also, but mixing that with objects and documents. So perfect work for me. And I set up my own company called History Wardrobe with the idea of teaching women's history through clothing. And so now my collection spans over two, 250 years of garments and I tour the UK, taking these objects and telling stories, but running alongside that always, always an, an interest and a drive to rescue lost stories and fragments and so on. So that's, that's very much part of Holocaust history, of course, and, and that work is ongoing. But I love, I love clothing. Not, I'm not into fashion, I'm not fashionable but I love the different textures, the colors, the memories, the way people go, oh yeah, I remember wearing this. And you know, when they look at photographs, oh, I can't believe I wore that. But I love the way people hold on to clothes as well as, uh, as their memories. So yeah, I've been in the business a long time and, and love it, still love it. Wow. So um, another question I have is, um, are there any garments surviving from that Auschwitz fashion salon? Maybe. We don't know. And that is the whole point in a way is that these clothes were made anonymously and they could be for sale on eBay. They could be in vintage markets. We don't know. I was in touch with Hedvig Huss's grandson and I said, you know, did she keep any, any garments from this era? And he said, no that the only garment left was a child's waistcoat, a leather waistcoat that had been taken from the plunder warehouses that his father, you know, one of the little boys, in fact, one of the little boys who used to come and play at the workshop, there is a story of this little boy coming with his mother Hedvig to a fitting and he would play with them until one day, but I'm not gonna tell you that story else, we'll run out of time. But yeah, she didn't, she didn't save anything. And to my knowledge, you know, there's, there's nothing with provenance and that's, What's so poignant, isn't it? Because all of these clothes that were stolen from murdered people, or in this case, made by the Jewish prisoners, they, they were circulated in Germany. You know, the clothes from Auschwitz and other places were sent back to Germany for, for victims of allied bombings. And so who knows what is circulating? Do they still have those little yellow threads from the gold, from the yellow stars on them? So the answer is, we don't know. Right, and I, I can only imagine that would be very difficult since uh, because of who wore them, who they were created for. Who would want to say, who would want to say, I mean, we know who some of the SS wives were, but nobody thought to interview them for starters. Uh, and also there was that sense of, oh, it's only women, isn't it? What do they have to say? And in the last few decades, there've been an increasing numbers of academics, particularly women, female academics and researchers who've been saying, wait, let, let's ask them. And let's us see what, you know, this fresh perspective that we can get on SS family life and the SS ethos. But who, was, who would want to brag and say, well, I had these, these Jewish women make my clothes. I didn't care what happened to them. Here's a dress they made for me. Yeah, I can't imagine them doing that. Um, 
were there any equivalent workshops for men? Yes. Mostly because in every single labor camp and concentration camp and the extermination centers, the SS used the talents of their prisoners. And so the men had their own pet tailors and cobblers and, you know, until they were done with them. And so they always wanted to profit from, to exploit in particular Jewish labor. So yes, there were equivalents, but I think the significance of having this fashion salon that was catering not only to, to the SS in Auschwitz, but also to SS in Berlin, I think it gives the most grotesque anomaly. But even not including um, ghetto workshops or, or uh, salons such as, as this one, there were inevitably people working uh, in secret for prominent prisoners, you know, prisoners who had more power, they would use other prisoners to knit and sew for them and tailor for them and so on. So everybody was trying to do a little better for themselves. Wow. Um, and I have, I think, one last question, um, which is, what are you working on next? Are you working on another book? Yes, yes. Um, well, I'm spending a lot of time um, talking around the world about this book because it's coming out in so many different places. It's fascinating to hear from people around the world. And I'm continuing to research, actually, because I still haven't found the names and fates of all the women, particularly the women who were shot escaping. And I, I would really like to do that. I think the chances are they don't have family members surviving. And I would like to know, you know, where they're buried. I would like to be able to... to keep their names alive a little more but yes I'm working on a book about three Jewish girls from Berlin and I'm researching their life as refugees in England but also what happened to the families when these three girls came to England on the, the very famous kinder transport and it, it is all through clothes as well so my question. <laughs> yeah. yeah it's very poignant Fine. I think it's very beautiful and sorrowful wow well, wonderful. We have a we have a few um, kinder transport survivors associated with our museum, and actually even a couple of pieces of clothing as well in our collection related to to one of those yeah, stories. Just so. to be in touch then, just yeah. <laughs> yeah. How many sweaters have you? No, no sweaters. <laughs> School uniform. <laughs> really? Yes. Mm. Yes. Oh, well, if any oh, of your well, well, transportees were in Bedfordshire at Shepherd School, that's what I'm currently looking up. A lot of also I'll, have to, I'll have to look at look up this particular survivor story. I can't remember what where she was, but you never know. So I will definitely let you know. <laughs> well, you're doing amazing work. Well, so are you. Thank you so much for um, telling the story the stories of these women. It's so important that we remember um, each person as one individual life um, that experienced this, this horrible event and um, take the lessons that we learned to improve our communities. So I really appreciate your time. It was an outstanding presentation. And I also wanna take another moment to thank those of you who tuned in this evening and remind you to please complete the survey that's going to show up right after we end here as a QR code. Um, and the address will also be in the comments below. So please just take a moment to do that. And from all of us at the Florida Holocaust Museum, I appreciate that you took time this evening to spend with us and to learn a little bit more about this untold story of the Holocaust. Thank you and have a wonderful evening. Yeah.